Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Amy Coyle for our talk on homeless medicine. Dr. Coyle is an assistant professor in both the departments of medicine and medical education at the Icon School of Medicine here at Mount Sinai. He received his medical degree from Case Western Reserve University and completed his residency and chief residency in internal medicine here at Mount Sinai. He's currently the Associate Program Director for Ambulatory Care for the Internal Medicine Residency Program. <coughs> Dr. Coyle is actively involved in the education of trainees at both the medical school and residency level, with a focus on care of underserved populations. In recognition of his teaching, he has been awarded the EHOP Excellence in Teaching Award, the Joshua Dixon Advancing Idealism in Medicine Award, and the Institute for Medical Education's Excellence in Teaching Award. His clinical kind of work focuses on the care of homeless persons within Mount Sinai's PAC clinic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Coyle. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Megan, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for having me uh, here today to talk about something that I'm very, very passionate uh, about uh, and something that I think has real implications for us as a hospital and as a health system. So first off, I have no financial disclosures. So today we're going to sort of talk about three things. I think there's a lot we, we could talk about that relates to caring for homeless persons here in the hospital and in our clinics. We'll try to focus our talk on talking about the, the current quality uh, of medical care we deliver to homeless persons, both in general uh, and specifically here at Mount Sinai. Uh, we'll review some high prevalence conditions in the homeless population uh, via some case discussion and identify some patient appropriate treatment strategies. And we'll discuss some high impact, low cost interventions to engage patients in care. So now we will talk about sort of first we'll look at trends in homelessness, both in the US and New York to give us some context for our discussion. We'll talk about the care of homeless persons here at Sinai. And then I'll tell you about three patients we've tried to engage in the last year uh, with sort of varying degrees of success to highlight a couple of sort of key points that I think are important to keep in mind. So I think that sort of first question is sort of why? Like why talk about caring for homeless persons? Uh, why not treat them like any other person in the hospital or even like any other vulnerable population? So I think the first step is really recognizing and, and admitting sort of the challenges these patients uh, pose to us as clinicians. Um, so I've done sort of a variety of talks on homeless health to uh, trainees at sort of all levels and primary care physicians and hospitalists. Uh, and something that I've done every time I've sort of done this talk that I won't do today uh, is I've asked them to think about their last encounter with a homeless person and describe it in one word. So I've had them sort of uh, submit through Poll Everywhere or polling software what that word was. And I'll show you a couple of the word clouds to give you a sense of sort of what we're facing when we think about caring for homeless persons. So this is from one group of, uh, of physicians. Um, so again, you see difficult, complicated, exhausting. There's some positives, gratifying. <coughs> again, another group, impossible. AMA, which unfortunately is a, a pretty uh, good observation, uh, hopeless isolated, but again, some positivity, resilient, proud. Um, again, uh, another group of trainees. So challenging, awful, shocking. Um, so I think we really need to sort of like embrace, accept this bias and our difficulties in caring for these patients. So hopefully by the end of this talk, I convince you that it's not impossible, though it may still be challenging to care for homeless persons, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. So we'll start sort of our talk and start our discussion thinking about trends in homelessness. First, I'll look at the national level. Um, so if you look at national estimates of the homeless population, we've seen over the last decade a pretty steady decrease in the total number of homeless persons. So a slow decrease but relatively steady downward trend, driven in part by excellent work done by advocacy organizations and governmental organizations. Much of that downward trend has been driven uh, by reductions in the unsheltered population. So the green line at the bottom is the unsheltered population in the United States, so people outside of the shelter network. So tremendous work being done uh, to move people into shelter and then into housing. You can see sort of parallel decreases when you look at the decrease in the population of uh, sort of chronically homeless individuals, those homeless for more than one year. And we've actually made tremendous strides uh, in reducing homelessness among veterans, which has been a, a national priority for the last decade. So significant decreases, with at least two states, Virginia and Connecticut, claiming to have eradicated homelessness among veterans. Um, so great strides being made at the national level. Regretfully, New York is a sort of terrible outlier in all of this. So if you look at the 2014-2015 uh, time frame, we had a 9.5% increase in homelessness in New York State while uh, nationally things were uh, downtrending. 
If you look over the last sort of nine years, the duration over which these reports have been generated, we've seen a 41% increase in the homeless population with an additional 25,000 homeless individuals in New York. So again, things seem to be getting worse in New York uh, as things are improving nationally. So when we look at the homeless population in New York, this is the shelter census. So they collect sort of daily uh, data on how many people are in the shelter system in New York. Um, so the peak was around 62,000. It's around 60,000 now on any given night in the New York City shelter system. In any given year, there's around 100,000 individuals within the shelter system in New York. So this is for all homeless adults. You can see sort of parallel trends in terms of families and shelters, children in shelters. So again, just a sort of astronomical increase at the time that we're seeing decreases nationally. Um, so we really face a, a significant challenge here in New York in caring for this population, specifically in New York City. When you look at the actual numbers, um, about 10 to 50 percent of all homeless uh, persons in the U.S. live in New York City. So again, an enormous homeless population here in New York. So uh, the, the other point that's really important to keep in mind that gives context to everything we'll discuss uh, about medical care for homeless persons uh, is the role of, sort of street homelessness here in New York. So up until this year, they did this thing called the Hope Street Sweep, where they got volunteers to mark off quadrants of the city and sort of walk up and down to identify persons who were street homeless. Uh, and this year was the first year in five years that the number has been pushed below 3,000. And you know that's sort of a tiny proportion of the total homeless population that resides in the shelter system. So if you look at cities nationally, uh, New York is actually pretty notable in that only around 4% of all homeless persons live on the street. So almost all of the homeless population in New York resides in shelters. So places that we sort of perceive as having extremely high homeless populations, like San Francisco, for example, their total number is, you know, is nothing compared to what we see in New York, but the percentage of those who live on the street is much, much higher. So it sort of is much more sort of the public consciousness. A lot of this is driven actually by uh, laws very specific to New York. Um, New York State actually constitutionally guarantees shelter. Um, so the shelter system cannot turn people away. I, I listed a couple, but there have been dozens of lawsuits against the city and the state uh, by groups trying to turn away people from the homeless uh, shelter system, and those have all failed. So New York State, really unique in that we guarantee housing for all residents of this state. Um, so again, most people reside in shelters. These sort of laws have a really interesting history, but I'll, I'll spare you, but it date back, dates back to the time when LaGuardia was mayor. So really this has been for a long, long time that we've made a conscious effort to guarantee housing for New York State residents. So there is, uh, you know, it's pretty sizable street homeless population still, much of, much of it clustered in Manhattan. So I showed you a little bit about the Hope Street Sweeps they did annually. I think a really great innovation by the mayor's office this past year has been this Homestat program they're rolling out. So rather than doing annual sweeps of the streets, they're doing daily sweeps of the streets in parts of Manhattan to really capture where homeless persons are residing in New York. So this is just a month's worth of that data. So obviously the, the darker uh, is higher densities of homeless persons in New York. So they, like us, use the 311 system so you can call and get the street team to, to help out with these uh, uh, people on the streets. So you see uh, these sort of dense concentrations. And we'll talk about the implications this has for our health system. But you'll see it sort of darkest right around the areas where Mount Sinai West and Beth Israel are. And they have enormous challenges uh, posed by street homeless populations. So again, looking at us uh, up on the Upper East Side, so less, uh, but still you still see clusters of street homeless persons uh, in our neighborhood. Um, so still a problem we're trying to uh, sort of tackle. So I'll, I'll sort of uh, briefly mention some of the sort of health characteristics of, of homeless persons in general, uh, and then we'll sort of move on to talking about our experience here at Sinai, and then sort of illustrate some of these points by talking about a couple of cases we've tried to engage here. So over the last maybe 10, 20 years, we've seen a, a real shift in who are the homeless. Um, for a long time, you know, the sort of stereotypical homeless person was a young adult male living by themselves, suffering from alcoholism. We've really seen the homeless population age uh, and at that same time have increasing degrees of sort of complex chronic medical condition that require long-term longitudinal primary care. At least a couple of studies have found that 40% of persons have at least one chronic medical problem uh, and then an average of nine medical problems per person in one study. So really high rates of chronic medical diseases. <coughs> 
At the same time, we know that they have extraordinarily poor access to care. So a study from Bellevue from now a decade ago found that fewer than 10% of homeless persons could identify a primary care physician versus 80% of housed uh, peers. Uh, in New York City, for example, only 47% had health insurance. So New York State had expanded Medicaid long before the Affordable Care Act, so many or even most of these persons would have been eligible for health insurance, but still weren't enrolled. Uh, and then significant proportions reported unmet health needs. So again, a uh, population that has chronic disease and unmet health needs. I think most striking for people who do work in this area is we know that homelessness in, in a number of studies has been independently associated with increased mortality. So kind of the landmark article on this was this study from Philadelphia in the mid-90s showing uh, age-adjusted mortality four times greater than the general population. We've seen that in New York as well. We've seen that as compared even housed peers may try to do some case matching. But homelessness seems to be independently associated with increased mortality. For those, those of us who, who do work in this field, I think the last study I, I think is the most disheartening in many ways. Um, so another study looking at mortality rates from Lancet in 2011. And I think to me what's so disturbing about this is this was a study from Denmark, which has a large and well-functioning national health service with very limited barriers to care and most services available free of charge. So I, I think our takeaway from this last study looking at Denmark uh, is that access to care is a piece of the puzzle but not all of it. It's going to take sort of focused targeting uh, to address the huge health disparities faced by homeless persons. And we'll talk a little bit towards the end about how we might start doing that. When you look at the sort of care of homeless persons, we sort of stereotypically think about acute complaints, things like rashes, pain, decaying teeth, assaults, and, and infectious diseases, both acute and chronic, HIV, hep C. Um, but again, we've seen this explosion in the rates of chronic medical conditions. Uh, it requires a whole different system of care than the one we've designed to care for homeless persons at present. And we'll talk about some of these that are very common conditions uh, in the context of a few of these cases I'll tell you about. So now we'll sort of segue to talk about the care of patients here at Mount Sinai, what we know about the homeless population here and how we sort of try to engage them in care. So this is us on a map. I think I had too much fun with Google Maps when I was putting this together. Um, so here's us. So when, when I, whenever I talk to sort of trainees or physicians, I, I always ask them if they can identify homeless shelters in our area. I think most can point out to the, the constellation of shelters out on Wards Island, but most don't know sort of other shelters in New York. So that will tell you that there are 240 shelters in New York spread through all five boroughs. So any hospital you look at is going to have an enormous number of shelters in the surrounding area. So all the blue stars are homeless shelters near us. So you see a pretty intense concentration of shelters in East Harlem and Central Harlem. And we'll talk about sort of the implications. So I made similar maps for all of our uh, affiliate hospitals. So Mount Sinai West within our system, again, a number of shelters near them. Mount Sinai St. Luke's even more, especially in Central Harlem. Mount Sinai Beth Israel, again, enormous numbers of shelters, an enormous number of sheltered persons who get care in these hospitals within our health system. So I'll tell you about sort of our experience here. So before we tried to design any intervention uh, to target these patients, we wanted to see what the current state of their health was. So over a six month period, we followed and found 217 patients admitted uh, to the inpatient medicine service here. So just the medicine service, just the inpatient side. Uh, on average, they were uh, in their 50s, uh, mostly male, though not entirely. Uh, and aside from the ED visit and hospitalization that brought them to our attention, they accounted for an additional 194 hospitalizations and 686 ED visits. So the average person in this sample is averaging around five ED visits and two hospitalizations per year, significantly more than sort of housed comparators. So a pretty sick population that had really high rates of utilization. So I'll tell you about three patients uh, who we've tried to engage. The first with limited success, the second two with, with much more success to sort of drive home a couple of these points. So the first, Mr. AB, he's a 58-year-old Hispanic gentleman. His history is significant for alcohol abuse and chronic pancreatitis, complicated by significant pain, uh, with several recent admissions to Mount Sinai. So in May of 2015, he was seen in the ED and then admitted onto the Gen Med service for pain control. On the second day here in the hospital, he was noted to be increasingly agitated and insisted on sighing out against medical advice, despite the night foot team's assurances that he could actually be discharged the next morning. If he just waited, they could discharge him. Um, so unfortunately, uh, this is sort of all too common a situation. So when we looked at these patients, we actually found that a staggering 19% signed out against medical advice. 
Um, when we reviewed the narratives of their discharge summaries, an additional 6% sort of like demanded to leave, but they didn't make them sign out. So again, 25% of patients had a sudden or unexpected discharge with surprising or not surprisingly little coordination of their care. So leaving sort of unexpectedly uh, like Mr. AB. So I'll tell you that he was discharged overnight back to the shelter where he reports having lived for the last two years. So he left overnight, so he got no medications, he didn't get any follow-up appointments. Um, we didn't really have any plan to engage him any further in care. So I would tell you, based on the sort of quality of this discharge, so obviously there's nothing else they could do, uh, not surprisingly, he was readmitted two weeks later. So right back here, same hospital, same complaint, same medical team. So right back to where we started. So when we looked at this population, we found that 30% of homeless patients are readmitted within 30 days here at Mount Sinai. So when we try to aggregate data from other hospitals in our health system, uh, and then data from the HealthX program, which monitors admissions throughout the city, we found that about 50% of homeless persons uh, had readmissions within 30 days at any hospital in New York. So about a 50% 30-day readmission rate, 30% here at Mount Sinai. So an extraordinarily high rate of readmission, much of it driven by sort of poor coordination of care. Um, so when you look at other places, so for example, Yale looked at a very similar thing. They found as well a 50% readmission rate. So these patients are really high risk to come right back to the hospital, often because of sort of unaddressed barriers to care or, or issues with their discharge. So we'll say that he, uh, he says that he'd been living in a Skyway shelter for the last several years, but he didn't really elaborate further on his living situation or case management in the shelter. So the second time he was admitted, the house staff team called uh, me and then our team to see if we could help out to coordinate care for this patient a little bit better. So I said there are 240 shelters in the New York City shelter system, so I certainly can't claim to know most or all or any of them that well. Uh, but Skyway Shelter is actually pretty well known. Um, it was the Skyway Motel. Um, so I mentioned that New York State has a sort of constitutional guarantee to housing that was enforced through a number of lawsuits. So that decree went into effect in 1981. So if it looks like every homeless shelter was built in the 1980s, it's because they all were built in the 1980s. Um, and the city was really desperate to get beds, so they bought anything they could. Um, so there's this, the Skyway Motel, um, there's an old Best Western in the Bronx, it's a homeless shelter, it looks like every Best Western you've ever seen, it's a homeless shelter. Um, hospitals, churches, warehouses, they converted everything they could find into homeless shelters. So the Skyway Motel is aptly named because it's right next to LaGuardia. Uh, or sorry, JFK, having airport confusion. So next to JFK. Um, so as I'm walking over, I'm sort of saying the story doesn't make sense. Like, it's, it's hard for me to believe that he's taking like a bus to like the E to the 6, uh, you know, a, a, a two-hour trip to come to our emergency room for chronic pain. And then when he got readmitted, he came back the same way as well. So the story is not making much sense to me as I'm sort of walking over to see him. And when you look at the shelters around our hospital, uh, and you look at where uh, our homeless patients are coming from, it's entirely driven by geography. So the stars in red are shelters that have had more than five individuals admitted to the hospital in the last year. So again, purely driven by proximity and by geography. The one blue one that's right next to us is a family shelter that only has like 40 families in it. Um, so the numbers just aren't high enough to generate many admissions. But again, purely driven by proximity. So again, this guy is probably not coming from two hours away. So when I look at his, his admissions, here are all his admissions here at Mount Sinai. So who notices the trend? Great, so they're all in the summer, so where is he really living? He's living in the park. Um, so for two years, um, sort of our inpatient social workers tried to coordinate care at a shelter where he didn't actually live. So it's no wonder they couldn't find his case manager. He or she didn't actually exist. Um, so I, I've gotten to know him pretty well. He's had uh, almost innumerable hospitalizations here and elsewhere. Um, so I finally got permission from him to sort of track down some of his other medical records. He admitted that he lived in Skyway when it's cold. He'll go back out to Queens when it's cold. And then he lives in the park when it's warmer. Um, so I got uh, medical records from Mount Sinai, Queens, Elmhurst, Jamaica Hospital, and a couple, a couple other hospitals in Queens. And this is his actual utilization pattern. So all the ones in black are hospitalizations out in Queens. So sort of filling out our sort of you know, suspected sort of utilization pattern. So when it's warm, he goes uh, to, to the hospital here. When it's cold, he's back out in Queens. And I think he's a sort of great and awful, uh, simultaneous example of sort of the discoordination of care for these patients. So his first name uh, can be spelled in a lot of different ways. 
and he has a medical record for each different spelling. Um, so at one point he had, I think, five different medical records at Sinai and different medical record numbers. When I got the records from all these hospitals, as far as I can tell, he got at least 10 CAT scans with contrast in 2015. So 10 different CT abdomen and pelvises. Um, he went to other hospitals as well I couldn't get records from. So at the very least, he got 10 CAT scans. So obviously a pretty poor utilization of resources for our health system, uh, and then a lot of danger to him. He's had an extraordinarily radiation exposure and, and contrast exposure. And this is sort of annually dating back for years. So I don't even want to know how many CAT scans he's gotten. So again, really, really awful discontinuity. So this is someone who's not really all that willing to engage in care, to be honest. Uh, you know, we've tried very hard, uh, but it's very, very hard to engage. So the question is sort of what is our strategy? How do we engage someone who doesn't want to be engaged? So a, a couple of strategies that I think are pretty effective. So the first almost feels silly to say, but compassionate care, being nice. Um, so it's a sort of amazing and wonderful study from Lancet from the mid-90s. Um, in a, a British hospital that had a high sort of volume of homeless persons, they actually uh, trained preclinical med students. They gave them like a 20-minute training on homeless health. Uh, and then they randomized homeless patients who were in the ED, either to usual care or to have a med student talk to them. So they just chatted with them, uh, you know, empathized with them, shared common experiences, 20, 30 minute discussion. And so that discussion, caring, actually reduced ED utilization and increased uh, follow-up rates in ambulatory clinics. So to me, like, what an amazing use of trainees. Like, like very brief intervention, improved outpatient utilization, reduced ED use. Um, so this is like a whole separate talk. But I think that and many other reasons why I feel very passionate about engaging trainees at all levels in care of homeless persons, I really do think it's a mutually beneficial arrangement to have trainees involved with homeless persons. So again, compassionate care, be nice. So for someone like this, he's probably not ever gonna come to IMA. Um, so despite my efforts, I've never actually seen him in the outpatient setting. I think he's getting tired of seeing me. Um, so consider primary care interventions in the hospital. So for hospitalized patients for discharge, we're held accountable for things like influenza vaccines, pneumococcal vaccines, smoking cessation. So really embrace those things. Do primary care in the hospital setting. For him, he's a chronic abuser of alcohol. Um, so consider things like hepatitis vaccinations, when we can, when appropriate for these patients. And don't ever assume that you're going to get them engaged in primary care. So take the opportunity to do primary care when you can. For him, harm reduction. So he is definitely in sort of the, the pre-contemplative camp and very strongly when it comes to quitting uh, alcohol use. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't encourage moderation and you can't encourage safe use. So he often drinks to the point of blacking out in the park. Um, I will say that around 40% of homeless persons report assaults in any given year. So they have a really high rate of victimization, really high rate uh, of assault. Um, so again, talking to him about safe drinking, drinking means with other people rather than alone to avoid uh, violence against him. Again, linking to community resources. So we wasted two years trying to coordinate with a shelter where he didn't live. Um, so using things like Goddard Riverside, who runs the, the Manhattan Outreach Consortium for Street Homeless Persons. So engaging them um, with his permission, letting them know where he's sleeping in the park so they can see him and help offer resources and support. And then really focus on relationship building, trying to build that relationship over time. I think with him, he's mostly annoyed by my and our persistence. But again, for some people, you want to sort of engage until they're sort of ready to uh, sort of really uh, begin care in the outpatient setting. And, and the last kind of takeaway from him is, um, especially for, for house staff trainees on the medicine service, like don't be surprised when these patients sign out AMA. Like I would really, really urge you to think about what you're going to do with them, how you coordinate with their shelter, like the second they arrive, because you just never know when they're going to leave. So that's our plan for Mr. AB. So I'll tell you about a couple more cases as well that, that drive home a couple of these points. So Miss CD. So she's a 48-year-old woman with a history of significant uh, depression, seizure disorder, asthma, and then a history of latent TB that was never treated. So she was seen in the ED in March for a productive cough and shortness of breath and was found to have a right upper lobe opacity and significant wheezing. So again, admitted to the medicine teaching service for evaluation. So they were rightly worried about tuberculosis. So homeless, right upper lobe opacity, positive PPD. Um, so in the upper left most, um, you see a sort of chart looking at the uh, number of cases of tuberculosis in the homeless population. Um, so actually, nationally and locally, we've made great strides in reducing tuberculosis among the homeless uh, by really aggressive screening protocols in shelters and then very aggressive treatment strategies for latent tuberculosis. 
We've actually had success everywhere in reducing TB. So it's maintained a, a pretty consistent rate, which is about 6% of all cases of tuberculosis in the US are in homeless persons. So when you keep in mind that homeless persons make up about one third of 1% uh, of all persons in the US, 6% is a pretty staggeringly high number. So really high rates of tuberculosis, not surprisingly. So I'll tell you, thankfully, she did not have TB. So she had negative AFBs times three, and she was treated for community-acquired pneumonia and an asthma exacerbation. So I, I know now that her low bar pneumonia resolved when we repeated a chest X-ray, and she had a, a positive PPD. So she had a diagnosis of latent TB. Another sort of great and, and sad example of the discontinuity that these patients face is I've actually encountered a number of patients just in the last several months or years um, who've gotten so many PPDs that they have like really aggressive reactions. They almost have like PPD-itis where it can inflame their entire arm where people don't believe they had a positive PPD. Um, so again, uh, really poor continuity of care. I want to talk about how we can sort of fix that. So I'll, I'll say for her, on the third day of hospitalization, uh, when the student on the team sort of probed a little more deeply about her mental health history, she admitted to multiple prior suicide attempts and then passive suicidal ideation at present. So psych saw her, but they ultimately deemed her safe for discharge. And since this is a, a real patient, I do want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about mental health in the homeless, so it's not the sort of exclusive focus of this. So around a third of all homeless persons have serious mental illness and half of those have co-occurring substance use disorder. I, I think the key takeaway is that homeless persons have an extraordinarily high risk of suicide. So this is just sort of one representative sample, finding 51% uh, had a history of suicide attempts. And in this one sort of national sample of about 3,000 homeless persons, 8% of our sample had attempted suicide in the last month alone. Um, so again, extraordinarily high rates, incredibly important to screen. Thankfully for her, um, she's actually engaged really well with psychiatric care uh, and is pretty well treated for her depression. So I'll tell you that she was discharged to home after a four-day hospitalization and then default made for her at the Gen Med Clinic at IMA. Unfortunately, she missed that appointment uh, and then when we called, sort of all of her listed phone numbers were disconnected. So we already talked about that these patients have really high readmission rates. Uh, they also have really poor follow-up rates, uh, much of it from our end, some of it from theirs. Um, so when we looked at these 217 patients who were admitted to Sinai, 37% had no clear follow-up plan. A lot of those, of course, is driven by patients who leave against medical advice. It can be hard to make plans overnight. But again, 37% had no clear plan. And by clear plan, I mean like any plan, like follow up in any particular clinic, any particular doctors. So more than a third, we didn't really even try uh, to make them follow up. And even worse, when you look at the patients who actually had follow-up, uh, only about 40% made it to the appointment. So again, we're not doing a very good job of making them appointments, engaging them in care. Uh, and then when we do, um, they have relatively high no-show rates. Um, so really, really challenging to engage these patients in care. And when we compared uh, homeless persons versus uh, like a domiciled comparison group, um, homeless persons are, are markedly less likely at Sinai to have a PCP. So less than half have a PCP identified at discharge. And by identify, I mean like any name on earth that's like a human name. It's mostly either none or sort of other provider where that's not really specified. Um, they're less likely to have follow-up arranged. They're less likely to show up to that follow-up. And so I, I think here at Sinai especially, we do a really great job of creating care coordination programs for vulnerable persons. So I think this next statistic is, is what sort of disheartened me the most, which is that they're actually much less likely to be enrolled in care coordination programs. So I told you this is an extraordinarily vulnerable population. So you looked at things like CPAC in the hospital, the packed clinic, uh, health homes. They're much less likely to be enrolled in these programs. So I, I think we had hoped with homeless persons that if you sort of target all vulnerable populations, sort of a rising tide will lift all boats. But we, we've seen here and elsewhere it doesn't seem to be true. That we really need a, a specific targeted approach to homeless persons. And with our sort of last case, I'll talk to you about what that approach might look like and what we tried to do here. Um, finishing up with, with Miss CD. So she was discharged home. Uh, she got a little extra azithro, some extra prednisone, discharge on Advair and albuterol. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, she missed her appointment. And then she, like the first patient, was readmitted within 30 days, uh, again, here at Sinai. So I guess as is the pattern, the second time she was here uh, is when I, I first met her. Um, so I asked her sort of why, like why did this happen, what's going on? And it turns out she didn't really fill any of her medications. She was unable to fill most of them. 
This is sort of a sort of old BMJ study, which I, I think about a lot when I see patients, actually. It followed 50 consecutive patients seen at a clinic that catered mostly to homeless persons. Um, so 50 consecutive patients who got prescriptions. And they found that 29 of those 50 never filled the prescription. It's almost 60%. Eight of those 29 who didn't fill the prescription actually asked for that medication by name. So even asking for medications, they weren't filling them. So huge barriers uh, to accessing care for these patients. So when I asked her, like, why didn't you get the medications? So she told me that Adver is not covered by her insurance. I told her she needed a prior off. And I said, well, why didn't you like, call someone? And she said that she was pretty sure that the, the right medication, she couldn't afford the copay anyway, so why bother? So for the last like, year and a half prior to engaging her, she was using albuterol solely for her asthma. Uh, she lives in a shelter that is often overcrowded, hot, lots of dust, mold, uh, smokers around her. So sort of like an asthmatic's nightmare. Um, so for the last year and a half, she'd been albu using albuterol probably on average around eight to 10 times per day. Um, so obviously she's running through albuterol pumps at like a furious rate. So with her even complicating care, um, is she told this sort of sad story that um, at another institution, she went to the emergency room trying to get refills on albuterol. And she was actually accused of being a drug addict. Um, so albuterol can be used to potentiate the high from crack cocaine. Um, so she was actually accused by an ED physician of, of being a drug seeker and faking her asthma for the sake of getting albuterol. Um, so again, in addition to really engaging her, you have to sort of build back that trust. So many homeless persons have had negative experiences in the healthcare system, uh, and it can be very challenging to rebuild that trust. These issues with medications come up extremely commonly. So just to mention a couple of examples from sort of our practice. Um, so in the last couple of months, I had a patient who requested transitioning off clonidine therapy. So she has very, very hard to control blood pressure, uh, in part due to probably genetics, family history, in part due to the extremely high salt content in the sheltered diet that she eats. Very hard to control. Uh, and she was on clonidine, uh, sort of like a last resort, her like sixth agent. Um, she actually requested to come off it because people were stealing the pills from her in the shelter. Um, so clonidine can be used to blunt the effects of heroin withdrawal. Um, so actually people were stealing her stuff trying to get her clonidine pills, so trying to go off those. Another example, uh, when you look at thiazide diuretics for hypertension, about a third of all homeless persons are non-adherent due to issues of bathroom insecurity. Um, so for her, um, she lives in a shelter that has 40 women sharing one bathroom. Um, so she is someone who would not take a thiazide, again, doesn't have access to bathrooms. And many homeless persons admit feeling sort of embarrassed to admit these kinds of things. The great thing is you don't need to know any of that, because I didn't know much of it when I was a trainee. Uh, but really just asking, asking why they're not taking pills, what are their barriers to care, uh, can go a really long way for these patients. So the last thing I'll say about her, um, is that she had latent TB and was actually really eager to be treated. Um, it was a real challenge for her to take daily pills. Like we were finally able to get her to take her anti-epileptics every day because she's terrified of having a seizure. But the thought of having her take INH daily for nine months seemed like an impossibility. So again, the key is sort of to think outside the box and think about uh, what strategies might be most effective for a particular patient in their particular situation. So for her, there's actually pretty good evidence that uh, a three-month course of rifapentine and INH with direct reserve therapy is not inferior to nine months of uh, INH therapy alone. Um, and the City Department of Health actually does this therapy. Um, so I included this mostly just to say that I'm pretty sure she was included in this cohort, which I find sort of fascinating. So we refer to, to the City TB Treatment Center, uh, and she got a three-month course of rifapentine and INH, which she completed. Uh, and this study uh, published in um, CID uh, this year actually showed that using this shorter course uh, resulted in an absolute increase in completion rates of around 30%. So incredibly effective. And for her, she was able to complete and complete in a way that sort of worked for her life. So again, taking in their particular situation to account when you think about what therapies to prescribe. So see, she's engaged really well in care and is doing really, really well in terms of her asthma control. So a real success for, for us and something we're very happy and proud about. So for her, the key point really is we need to do a better job of coordinating care so sort of just making the appointment is enough. We need to assume that they're not going to be able to come and need ways to track them down. So shelter locations, case managers, phone numbers. And we need to be continually reassessing the barriers to care for these patients. So I'll talk to you about what a model might look like for caring for homeless persons and what we're trying to do uh, in the PACT clinic here at Sinai. So to sort of lead into the third patient, 
Um, we know there's been a sort of significant transition in the homeless population. As they've aged, they have an increasing burden of chronic diseases. So many of these patients we care for have multiple disease diseases cared for by multiple subspecialists, and coordinating their care is the real challenge. So when you care, compare sheltered adults versus uh, housed adults in New York, they have higher rates of heart disease, of cancer, of HIV AIDS, and substance abuse related deaths. And actually in, in the last couple of years, both uh, heart disease and cancer have increased above substance abuse as the leading causes of death among homeless persons. To give you a sense of sort of the complexity of, of patients uh, we're caring for, uh, of the first 50 patients that we sort of recruited and enrolled and packed, there are four transplant patients among that mix, two of whom have cardiac transplants and have very complex multi-specialty care. So the homeless population in North has an incredible complexity of chronic disease that we need to build a system uh, to care for. All right, well, I guess we need to update semantic. Uh, all right. Um, so I just want to put this up because it's an interesting connection to Mount Sinai. I hope at least a few people in the room recognize this gentleman. Um, so when you think about caring for homeless persons, um, in the 70s, this idea of sort of specialized clinics evolved uh, to care for homeless persons. So the first such clinic was uh, an SRO-based clinic at St. Vincent's, uh, run by Dr. Phil Brickner, who worked here uh, at the very end of his career for a couple years. Um, so built this program at St. Vincent's providing care for persons in SROs. Um, that model was then used in the uh, Robert Wood Foundation uh, uh, demonstration grant of 19 healthcare for the homeless sites, among them the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program that's so well known. And that's expanded to more than 200 clinics nationally. So an interesting and nice connection. Dr. Berkner unfortunately passed away around two years ago, but really a wonderful uh, advocate for, for homeless health that I thought I should mention. So there's been this sort of like eternal debate about whether we should engage homeless people in general medical clinics or we should build specialized clinics for them. That's sort of been the discussion for the last 20 to 30 years. And I think I would argue that discussion sort of no longer has merit. Um, I think that made sense when we were caring for people who had relatively acute complaints. But we have a system now that's built to deliver episodic care to people who have chronic conditions that need longitudinal care. So I think really the key is, is using sort of intensive primary care with social work support to engage patients and then finding ways to transition them back into the general medical pool. And we'll talk about how PAC can do that. So the last patient I'll tell you about is Mr. EF. So a 57-year-old gentleman, history of hypertension, diabetes, and IV drug abuse. He lives on a Keener shelter on Wards Island. So he was admitted with a diabetic foot ulcer and marked hyperglycemia. So again, admitted to the Gen Med Teaching Service, started on fluids, gabapentin, uh, and then he was mentioning he was having trouble taking insulin in the shelter. So we can use diabetes as, a, as an example of how we might manage a, a chronic disease in the homeless population. Um, so for him, Mr. EF, he had a real challenge in taking insulin. Um, so his shelter bans syringes for fear of abuse for IV drugs. Um, many shelters that don't ban them, it's a real issue of having them stolen by other shelter residents. Um, so again, insulin pens work very well for him. The real challenge is there's no access to a refrigerator. Insulin needs to be stored in the refrigerator. Um, so the FDA mandates that it must be stable outside of the fridge for 30 days. So making plans about when and how to dispose of insulin that he's not using if it's kept out for too long. For him, pushing patients to get foot exams. He told me he only had looked at his feet in two years. Um, and I think there's multiple studies that I really find sort of heartbreaking uh, of homeless people um, and sort of the foot exam for diabetes that show the real barriers to care. In one study, 70% of homeless diabetics reported that uh, foot odor or the condition of their shoes was a deterrent to going to the physician and getting a foot exam. Um, I mentioned a little bit a second ago, um, uh, Jim O'Connell, who's a sort of founding physician of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program, tells us a really interesting story that when he first started there, it was actually a nurse-driven program before physicians ever joined. Um, the first month, the nurses wouldn't let really him like care for patients. All they let him do was wash patients' feet and talk to them. Um, so I think that's sort of a great sort of example of, of really sort of eliminating those barriers to care and taking care to patients. In him, it's been a real challenge thinking about sort of the risk of hypoglycemia. Many shelters restrict food. They're not allowed to have food outside of sort of regular like cafeteria hours. So they may not have any snacks or any glucose uh, if they become hypoglycemic. So carefully weighing the risks of tight control versus more lenient control. And I'll tell you in a sec what we did with him. So 
So the team is sort of preparing him for discharge, and they're asking us, like, how can we coordinate care, and how can we maximize the chances he actually comes to our clinic? Um, and when you look in the literature at sort of common elements of successful homeless care programs, these are the features that show up sort of time and time again. So if clinic that addresses immediate needs first, that facilitate transitions from inpatient to outpatient, that have sort of open access models with intensive social work, social work support. So as we looked at this, um, really what this reminded us was a clinic that already exists, which is IMA PACT. So IMA PACT is the clinic within the CAM building that cares for patients who have frequent utilization. Uh, it's, it can be very challenging, a very challenging population, uh, but it, it's a model based on intensive social work support. So it follows a sort of ambulatory ICU model, intensive primary care for patients with high utilization, staffed by MDs, NPs, pharmacists, social workers, care coordinators, administrative support. Supporting very intensive support to patients with high utilization in the hopes of stabilizing their medical condition, stabilizing their social situation, and ultimately transitioning them back to the general practice. So our goal for these patients is to sort of layer on top a couple additional features within the packed clinic to care for homeless persons. And I'll talk about that in a second. So um, I didn't really mention it much, but um, unfortunately, as physicians, we're really terrible at documenting social history and housing status. Um, so when we look, there isn't really much correlation between what's in our notes and their actual housing status. Luckily, nurses are really good. Um, and as part of their admission flow sheet, there's actually a housing question, which I feel like I, I never knew existed, and I feel like has never really come up. But there is a housing question that nurses have to answer. And from that, we actually run sort of daily reports. So this is yesterday. These are all the homeless patients in the hospital. Let's see with their names bored out. So currently we have 13 patients in the hospital who are homeless on all different services, all different floors. Um, I'll choose now to mention that you'll see, I mentioned poor rates of PCP. So only three of 13 have any listed PCP, one of whom left Sinai I think three years ago and does not live in New York State. Um, so we'll call that two of 13. So really low rates of primary care physicians. So when we think about these models, we think about how we might apply them in IMA PACT. So, so let's just focus on, on harm reduction. So focusing on reducing negative consequences associated with substance abuse. Up to a third abuse either alcohol or other substances. So we want to provide non-judgmental care. So encouraging things like needle exchange programs, opiate substitution therapies like methadone or suboxone, naloxone distribution. So pre pre uh, prescribing naloxone in New York got like infinitely easier in the last year. So all New York State Medicaid plans are required to cover naloxone. Uh, and actually at pharmacies all around the city, you can get naloxone without a prescription. Um, so Rite Aid, CVS, and Dwayne Reed all carry intranasal naloxone that patients can get without a prescription. So again, making sure patients who abuse IV drugs uh, can do it as safely as possible. So again, giving patient-centered care and trying to address immediate needs first. So I think the biggest deterrent to seeking care for homeless persons is the unreasonable expectations we often set. So to yesterday, I was, I was seeing patients, and I had a patient who uh, didn't come, he no-showed, and he misses about half of his appointments. So he's a homeless gentleman, he, he works, about 20% of homeless persons have jobs. Um, so he works as a janitor on a night shift. Um, he actually lives in the building he cleans. Um, he sleeps on a table every night. Not surprisingly, and quite sadly, I see him for chronic back pain, among other things. Um, so anytime he can get an extra shift, he like misses his appointment. So I talked to him last night, he had an extra shift, he missed his appointment. So recognizing that your priorities are, may not be their priorities is sort of the key. Um, again, having reasonable expectations. Um, so many of the patients I see who have hypertension uh, have very poor diets that are beyond their control. So we can work on strategies to sort of reduce the risk. Um, but again, you may not be able to achieve tight blood pressure control. And your goal is to sort of maintain them and engage them in care, not to set unrealistic expectations for what they can do. Again, we want to make sure we have an open access model, which IMA PACT does. So the goal is to build rapport over time. So all the other providers in PACT have, have seen my patients, for which I'm so grateful. Because uh, you know, we encourage them to come in whenever they need care. We want to facilitate trans, trans, uh, transition from inpatient to outpatient. So leveraging the CPAC program, the social work driven 35 day bundle after discharge. So using them to really engage patients in care and make sure they make it to clinics. So trying to enroll preferentially homeless patients in CPAC. Intensive social work support. So we want to make sure that uh, we're providing demonstrable benefit to them. So again, you want to make sure you're addressing their immediate needs, many of which are not medical in the first place. 
So in PACT, we found joint visits with social workers to be an incredibly effective model. But in your practice, engaging them with social work uh, can be sort of the key to getting them in care. You want to take a sort of homeless-specific patient assessment. Um, so we know that being homeless poses unique challenges and barriers in terms of achieving care. Um, so consider screening for high-risk conditions. So I haven't mentioned yet, but hep C. In some studies, the rates of hepatitis C in the homeless population is as high as 20 or 30 percent. So again, screening for high-prevalence conditions uh, and then really assessing their barriers to care at every visit. And then linking patients to needed services. Um, so as an example of another patient of mine, many patients are transitioned from shelter to shelter throughout the system. Um, and in him, you can sort of track his medical conditions by where his specialist is located to know when it was diagnosed. So he's a pulmonologist at Lutheran, he's a cardiologist at NYU, he's a nephrologist at St. Vincent, uh, St. Luke's, excuse me. Um, so it, it's been challenging to coordinate his care, uh, but making sure we do that to avoid duplication, and then when necessary, consolidate care um, to overcome this lack of trust in the medical system. So uh, a couple of the last points about this medical home. So mobilizing community partnerships. I wish I had an entire hour to talk about the amazing work that advocacy groups in the city are doing for homeless persons, but finding ways to partner with them uh, around shared goals for patients. And then thinking about plans for continued engagement. Um, so I, I think one of the key takeaways from this talk is to avoid assumptions uh, about caring for homeless persons. So a striking number have cell phones or access to computers. Um, so providing the same opportunities to engage in care we provide to all other patients. But I've actually found that my charge is incredibly effective. Uh, most shelters have computer labs or have computers on site. So almost all my patients are able to use my chart after sort of a brief demonstration. Uh, and then phone and text reminders have great evidence in the homeless population uh, to sort of engage them in care. So we'll talk about how this was applied to Mr. EF and how he might do this on a sort of broader scale. So he was evaluated by the social work and MD team in the hospital, uh, and he was enrolled in the CPAC program, so the social work uh, post-discharge program. So we did a health assessment to evaluate his needs. We coordinated with the inpatient house staff team, uh, and the discharge follow-up was scheduled for two days after his visit, so very short-term follow-up. We confirmed his phone number, his shelter location, uh, he received text and phone call reminders of his appointment. Transportation was arranged for him. So thinking about all the components of care. So Mr. EF continues to use intermittent IV drugs. Um, he is not interested in abstinence, so we've done all we can to reduce his harm. He uses quite infrequently, so he's not really a candidate for opiate substitution therapy, nor is he interested. Uh, but we have made sure that he has intranasal naloxone and knows how to use it. So as an example, both uh, Beth Israel and Roosevelt in our health system have really great patient education classes for use of naloxone, so a great resource for us. For him addressing immediate needs first, so he had no connection of his diabetes to his foot pain. He cared most about sort of pain control. So our, our goal is to aggressively control his pain with non-opiate pain medications, and then work closely with the social workers in our clinic to apply for benefits. So he wanted to apply for food stamps and SSI first, uh, and sort of his other medical conditions came second. So addressing his needs and recognizing his priorities. Again, encouraging ambulatory utilization, so an open access model. Uh, facilitate transition from inpatient to outpatient, so enrolled him in the CPAC program. Intensive social work support, so in PACT, I think we do an amazing job of, of leveraging the skills of our social workers to provide great care to patients. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, even with like 20 minutes of training, you know, medical students giving compassionate care can improve outcomes. Uh, and social workers who have extensive counseling experience have been invaluable for us in our endeavors. Giving homeless specific patient care. So for him, with microvascular complications, my goal A1C for him would be sort of well less than 7%, pretty aggressive control. But in talking to him, um, he had trouble getting access to insulin in the shelter. Uh, he had very poor hypoglycemic awareness. He did not have access to snacks or glucose tabs overnight and was extremely concerned about the risk of hypoglycemia while he was sleeping. Um, so sort of dying in the shelter was his sort of biggest fear. So we reduced his A1C from 15 to 8, but have decided to hold there. So again, being very patient-centered and, and think through the barriers to their care. Doing screening tests for him has been a real challenge. So I mentioned already about lack of bathroom access for diuretics. Uh, even further compounding that, or, or another further example of that, uh, is the issue of colon cancer screening. So in him, no way to do a screening colonoscopy. Him. So doing fit testing for him uh, and work positive, thinking about creative ways to get bathroom access for a diagnostic colonoscopy. Thankfully, his fit test was negative. So linking patients needed health service. So he has specialists all around the city 
coordinating his care and, and centralizing when possible. Partnering with his shelter. So shelters in New York, it's great. They're incentivized to get patients into housing. So their incentives are like perfectly in line. And often the thing holding them back is medical care. So we found that case managers at shelters are, are very eager to work with us uh, to sort of improve the health of their patients. So having a plan for continued engagement. So Mr. EF loves my chart. Um, so we'll send me messages, things for refill. So again, not making assumptions about what they can do. So over the last six months, I've seen him basically every two to three weeks. Um, and now kind of comes a time to think about transitioning his care. So his chronic diseases are extraordinarily well controlled. Uh, his social situation has stabilized and he's working closely with case management and housing supports in the shelter to find permanent residents. And now our goal is to transition him back to the general medical population. We'll to play with his own challenges, but it's sort of necessary. When we think about the, the scope of homelessness, we know that sort of intensive uh, homeless specific programs can't conceivably care for 60,000 patients in the city. So I think we need to be innovative about leveraging existing programs for high risk patients and making them sort of homeless specific as we've tried to do with impact. So again, when we think about sort of the burden of homelessness in New York, we know that um, both street and sheltered homeless uh, reside around our hospitals in extraordinary numbers. Uh, and sort of whether we want to or not, we're sort of in the business of homeless health now. Um, and and I, I am really hopeful. I think we have a tremendous opportunity to partner with area shelters. So we know our patients are coming from a relatively limited number of shelters. So we're trying to work hard to build a clinic to engage them within the PACT program uh, and then work to engage these shelters around the care of their patients. I know in, in your various divisions, clinics, you also are grappling with this issue of homelessness. And, and so I think we're really excited to work with you and think further about how to create best practices for Sinai, for our hospital, about how to care for these patients. So I'll wrap up by just sort of summarizing that uh, we know that the care of homeless persons both uh, locally and nationally is quite poor and marked by discoordinated, poorly delivered care. Um, they have tremendous barriers to care, and the key is taking a patient-centered approach. And it's sort of easy for me to say, uh, and it seems straightforward and seems simple. That's because it is. Um, addressing barriers to care, asking about their experience can go an enormously long way. And we talked about these common principles of homeless care models, many of which we can do wherever we practice. So focusing on harm reduction, facilitating transitions, and taking this homeless-specific approach to the care of these patients. I'm, sorry, I'm hopeful this is just a start of a discussion about how we better care for and engage homeless patients here. So I'll wrap up by thanking a great number of people. So you see the huge list of PACT, uh, which I think is a great example of, of how big and, and effective our team is. So uh, uh, huge thanks to Ramiro Jervis, the clinical lead for PACT, and Norma Lopez, the social work lead for the PACT program. All of our terrific social workers, providers, and care coordinators um, who do an amazing job, an inspirational job to me of caring for incredibly challenging patients, some of whom are now uh, homeless and in the shelter system. Um, some inspirations to me within the world of homeless health, Mark Rabner, Phil Brickner, who are tremendous advocates for homeless persons. Um, within medical education, Dr. Silmi, Dr. Thomas, uh, have been sort of great mentors uh, and sort of walked me through this process. And then last but not least, within uh, my home division, DGIM, uh, Teresa Soriano, uh, who was sort of in on this from like the first thought, um, was a great person to sort of think through these issues and uh, what we're doing certainly wouldn't exist without her support and help, so I'm ever so grateful. And then again, the division uh, leadership, Juan, Anya, and Mary, so thanks so much for your support. And I will end with a totally gratuitous picture of my nine-month-old daughter, <laughs> and hopefully we've left enough time for uh, some questions. Mm -hmm. Has there been an experience between you and visiting doctors? No, uh, in small ways. So especially, um, what was sort of the remnants of the, the St. Vincent's program. They do a lot of care in, in SROs. Um, so I think we've sort of worked closely, and I think that's sort of the next step is thinking about how we sort of create best practices locally for these patients. I agree. Um, the challenge has really been in New York is that many sort of aid organizations are not willing to do shelter-based care. Um, so VNS has, has been a challenge to work with at times, uh, and the City Department of Health. So for example, treating latent TB, um, there's a lot of difficulty 
it seems crazy, a lot of difficulty in getting shelter-based direct deserve therapy for latent tuberculosis. So the population that most needs it can be most challenging. But I think that is the next frontier, is combining both sort of engagement in the shelter with engagement here in the clinic. I, I think we've consciously tried to shy away from a pure shelter-based clinic model, which is what many places do. I think that's excellent at delivering episodic care. But I think as we talked about with this transition and the aging of the homeless population, I think that model doesn't work. So again, you know, two of the first 50 patients we enrolled have heart transplants. So I can do a lot. I can't manage immunosuppressants in cardiac transplant patients. So we need them to come here. Um, and we need them to have a home here at Sinai so we can engage them with other specialists. So it occurs to me that if you're taking transplant patients into your program, there must be something different about this group because ordinarily they would not be accepted for a transplant program. So what is different about them or about uh, their uh, actually complying with the necessary uh, things that the program needs to go into this? It's a, a, a great question to which I, I don't have the perfect answer, but um, I'll also sort of give you two uh, thoughts that I have based on that. Um, so the first is that homelessness can happen to anyone. So these are patients who are carefully screened by transplant social workers and thought to be excellent candidates for transplant, and they became homeless. So homelessness can happen to anyone, no matter the protection you have. The second is that I think they are emblematic of a shift towards chronic disease, but I think it's a great example of how resilient, so I pulled up to put this word here, which I, I love, resilient homeless persons are. So despite the chaos of transitioning in and out of shelter, living on the street, these patients have managed to take their immunosuppressants religiously. They never miss doses. Um, so I think it's a great example of, again, not making assumptions just because they have sort of a chaotic social situation doesn't mean they can't and won't adhere to therapy and engage in care. Great, so why don't we talk, thank Dan and Andy for a great talk. Today.